So without further ado, we can get started. I would like uh, to get a nice uh, round of applause for our featured speaker for the first event of our speaker ser series, uh, Kara DeVott, CEO and founder of Bloombright. So a round of applause. And <laughs> Uh, Kara and I are going to have to use our uh, bellowing outdoor voices because uh, we uh, just, we don't have the microphones we wanted to have. So um, thank you for being flexible. Yes, no problem. <laughs> Great. So this way a little bit. So I can be pretty loud, so I think this will be fine. So <laughs> uh, a lot of these uh, these talks start uh, uh, with telling us a little bit about, uh, about your history, the origination story so to speak. Uh, do you uh, come from a family that has that, that entrepreneurial spirit and drive? Yes. So we were just talking about that. Um, my grandfather, uh, both of my grandfathers and my father all are entrepreneurs. And I don't know, I guess I never really thought about it too much until being an entrepreneur myself, being married to somebody who works for the government, <laughs> and seeing the differences and sort of how you, you know, grow up and think about work. Um, with my dad, it was seven days a week, and if it was Christmas, and so he has a trucking company, and so if someone needed something, then he would go and come back. And I don't know. It seemed exciting. And that was uh, normal. That was normal. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so then, with that example, did you just jump into entrepreneurship and start being the boss for your own thing from the get-go, or? I didn't. Um, you know, reflecting back, I when I was five, I guess I wanted to own my own business, which is sort of an odd thing when you're five. Um, I didn't really know what that was. Kind of always had a dream of owning a flower shop, but. Um, besides just working in one, I went to law school and pursued a path um, that was, I don't know, I guess kind of has that prestige to it, right? And I didn't, don't like blood that much, didn't want to be a doctor, uh, knew I didn't want to touch people for a living, uh, but was curious and liked a lot of different things, took every career inventory. Um, don't, uh, don't love rules though, so I'm not sure why Law school is what I ended up choosing. Um, and yeah, I just kind of found myself um, looking for something that would be exciting. So it took a while to get here. Yeah. So um, law school uh, took you, like, law took you where? So I, well, I went to Michigan State here and then Indiana University and then out to University of Hastings in San Francisco, finished there. Uh, transferred everything back past fail. So that was awesome to be in San Francisco on student loans and uh, private student loans, which you can get more of when you're there, which is even better. Um, and then, yeah, I didn't, I didn't want to practice. I knew that I'd worked in a firm downtown here in the summers. And so I started teaching political science and loved that, except that there wasn't like a result really like you know I, you could teach and people it was fun to discuss it but you never really knew how much people were taking with them and i also started selling handbags at coach retail and really was terrible actually until they came out with one i loved so i don't really understand why you'd spend three hundred dollars on a handbag until i fell in love with one and then there's all these like features of them so then i started seeing that there's actually value in like using this to have almost a better a better life really like you can organize it put your keys in it that kind of thing and um, really fell in love with sales uh, and then turned that into recruiting in LA so I went back to the West Coast back to the West Coast yep worked for an entrepreneur out there and uh, so that's uh, that's again working for another firm. Um, and what uh, are some of those? What are some of the lessons that you learned from that experience working with that recruiting firm? That you well, I think it was exciting to watch to watch another entrepreneur. So I was employee four, um, and it was it was pretty intense. And he was very like talented and successful at what he was doing. He did contingency recruiting, which is probably the model most of you guys are familiar with, where you basically like sell somebody for 
like 25% of the first year salary, um, client buy, you know, basically hires them and then pays you a commission. Um, so we did that and he, um, he was, uh, I think he was first generation here from Lithuania. And so he really had a lot, like we worked 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. It was, it was pretty intense and uh, was definitely the hustle, the hustle behind um, starting a business. And so I ended up helping to grow it. And I think, I think I got the bug there and then started my own um, recruiting firm right after that. that Were you able to witness him go through uh, some, some episodes that required a, a, a amount of grit? Yeah, I think all of them. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, we, um, yeah, he definitely fired a lot of people. Uh, so that, that was interesting. Um, and yeah, I mean, recruiting is an interesting field because there's, uh, there's no barrier to entry. Um, there's no ethics really necessarily, like even like realtors have a guideline for ethics. We don't have that. Uh, there's no education really. Um, so it was a kind of a fascinating field uh, to navigate. Mm -hmm. Kind of murky then. Very. <laughs> yes. Like playing in the mud? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, that, that brings uh, uh, up one of the, the words in the title of the talk. Mm -hmm. I think that would be in integrity. Yes. So, yeah, I think the, you know, kind of the theme of this in a lot of ways is, um, you know, how do you, like in a lot of ways, your business is a reflection of, of honestly, like who you are. Um, so you are, what you do um, is actually a new book out by Ben Horowitz from Andreessen Horowitz, um, really big VC firm in San Francisco. And yeah, I think navigating like uh, coming from law, which was very, you know, prescribed and then going into a field where it was do whatever you want, whether that's just making as much money as you want. And that really was the incentive to, you know, do the, the easiest placements, make the most money, go where there's the biggest budgets. And um, I found myself really wanting to be challenged. So I built a relationship with Microsoft, uh, which was very challenging. And like, I wanted to work on the harder searches and I didn't want to uh, abandon the clients when the searches got hard. Um, and so that created a really great partnership. And um, yeah, I think, you know, looking at, you know, kind of your principles and your values and regardless of whether you're successful or not, like being able to, you know, kind of look, your, look yourself in the mirror at the end of the day is what matters. Um, have you, you bring up that uh, Microsoft example, have you always been attracted to the more difficult, like prey? Like, uh... <laughs> I think so. I mean, I always like a challenge. I think probably that's the case for a lot of people in startups. Um, you know, just doing things in, in a lot of ways. I mean, consulting. Um, so kind of can think of us like the McKinsey of recruiting. So we actually partner closely now with uh, companies internally. So we don't basically just bill for our time. Um, and sometimes we'll do retained searches. Um, but yeah, I mean, companies hire us because it is difficult and they can't um, can't do it themselves for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. So I think that's kind of our, our niche. And uh, that brings up uh, a keyword resiliency. Indeed. <laughs> Indeed. So, you know, I think in recruiting or really probably any profession and certainly being an entrepreneur, that resiliency piece is everything. Um, so just that ability to like bounce back from things that are difficult. And I think inevitably, you know, even if you have $50 million or $2,000 for a startup, um, you're going to hit product market fit, or I have this really difficult situation and it's not going well, like, what do I do with it? Mm -hmm. Or this person I hired just quit and I need them to finish this. Like, what, what do you do? Yeah. So yeah, getting back up after you're not sure if you can do it and doing it anyway. Um, and so that uh, that is it's part of your entrepreneurial like journey and story. You've been through a couple of businesses. Mm -hmm. um, now uh, you're you have Bloombright. Mm -hmm. And how old are you? I'm 41. Bloombright. <laughs> Bloombright is three. <laughs> I'm in my 40s now, so I can just say that. I don't care. There's no shame. Um, 
Bloom Bright is three years old, so it's been an exciting journey. Um, we have about like 15 ish em employees from here to Virginia, Miami, and then mostly in California, actually. So do a lot of our work out there and work with a lot of um, some companies you guys might know, like Nextdoor, um, I don't know if anyone here uses that. We just had a huge hire there. This guy, Laddie, had a huge hire over there. So um, super exciting. Sorry. We're celebrating <laughs> today. <so. laughs> I'm just waiting for this to end so we can have some fun. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that all speaks to that uh, that resiliency uh, thing, where some some of these are pretty like long tail sales processes, right? Yes. The cycle is pretty long, and then when you when you get that placement, that hire, mm -hmm. it's time to celebrate, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think um, for us, it really because again, we don't. There's no fee on this. Um, we're not celebrating because we just made you know a couple hundred thousand dollars. Um, we're celebrating because we we don't make decent money in what we do, but we're partnered so closely with them that it is for us helping next door. Um, like this is this is a huge hire for them um, and their local initiatives that will have like an impact on how far they go. Um, it's the relationships we've built with them and the trust and then with this candidate who, you know, is, is gonna bring her expertise here and um, it's exciting. So yeah, just that like yep. ability to help people and, and make a difference is awesome. Um, and uh, and the way you speak about this uh, brings up uh, another keyword that you know the, like <clears throat> back to authenticity, right? Like where you like you, you like you live for these moments, right? I do. That's awesome. Yes. Um, I mean, I'm passionate about a lot of things, so it's not not just recruiting sure. that I'm passionate about, but. I think it's the helping people and you know, I think for a lot of the students and the audience, I mean, I had no idea what I wanted to do. Um, I liked a lot of different things. It was just seemed so hard to figure out how to bring them all together. And I mean, hopefully I'm not done with my journey of growing yet because I'm old and I'm young. <laughs> it depends on your perspective. Um, but yeah, kind of looking back at everything, like just being able to pursue the things that interest you and then the things that you're good at, like what do you enjoy doing, what gives you energy, what kind of drains your energy, and then being able to put those things together. Um, like I kind of look at, I was a psychology and a political economy major and looked at um, labor and industrial relations programs and um, like add a little bit of sales and the entrepreneur stuff. And then we're in this field that is essentially the wild west. It's still developing, it's exciting. Um, so I don't think I could have planned it. Yeah. And I get to work in my favorite city. I mean, I love Grand Rapids. I'm from here originally, my family's here. I like being here, it's intentional, uh, but I love San Francisco. So now I have a company that works out there and like I don't, all kind of came together. Awesome. Now. Um, I, uh, we, we, we've had a couple of conversations, um, ahead of this to, you know, gather some notes. Now there was a discussion you were having, you were telling me about whether to even call your startup or Bloombright a startup anymore. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so I think there's a lot of different phases. Um, I started Bloombright, that uh, was Pareto people at the time. I love Pareto, he's an Italian economist. Um, and we had a, a little copycat in Dubai who just took the name and all the website. And then that would be fine because I don't do business in Dubai, except that LinkedIn and Google and you know, all of those companies have the same name with the same description. So it was confusing. Uh, so now we have Bloomberg trademarks so we can sue anybody. Thank you, legal background. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, yeah, so we've gone from just me, uh, basically contracting myself to Stripe, um, helping to recruit recruiters for them, to be with some contractors kind of hidden in the background uh, <laughs> to help me do work, um, to having some full-time employees, and yeah, three people, um, or three years now, I feel like we're, We've had a lot of success. Um, we've also learned a lot of hard lessons. And so I feel like we now are at a really good like foundation to build on, um, which feels like 
putting in a little bit more process and structure and that's not really my thing so I you know have a team that's kind of helping me do that and um, blending the chaos I guess of those of us who love startups with people who like to scale <laughs> scale companies so uh, are you gonna miss the, the startup phase I you know that's what's exciting I think about startups is the journey um, like I didn't know this about myself but I might be someone who actually just likes to start things um, maybe I'm gonna love to run bloom right till the end of time and that'll be it but I already have another business that I started um, called bling dream so I'm always in jewelry and I literally get distracted by bright shiny objects so <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I I might be a little bit addicted so so now so you are now in the process of still starting up bloom right maybe with some scale some yes. maturity, and yep. some intentional growth there, and now you're starting Wing Dream also. Yes. It's cool. It is. Yeah, with kids and a family and you know all that, it's, it's a lot. So I think that's the ultimate, probably a lot of people here can identify with the inability to say no because it's exciting um, and then you want to do it. So. And yeah. uh, you just brought up uh, the, the aspect of having family mm -hmm. and then um, I imagine uh, growing, scaling, or starting a startup to start up to then now move right. Um, any kind of uh, fun challenges or? Yes. To speak to on that? So I started Boom Right when my son, I don't even think he was a year old, and my daughter was, I don't even think, three. Or maybe they just turned one and three. So I'm not sure I would recommend that. Um, I in a lot of ways kind of did it though because of being a mom. Uh, I worked for a consulting company for a long time and found it, um, yeah, just kind of difficult to have like the, the qualities that I cared about reflected in the business that I worked for and then being able to be myself, um, which is someone who's really committed to work and excited about the work I do, but also really committed obviously to my children, um, especially when I had one of them who was sick and so he required a lot of care. So I think it's those those times too. Like for me, building Bloom Bright is a place where people can like have hopefully have kids and have a life and have you know loved ones. You know, ideally not pass away, but if they do, like go be with them, go take time away to travel, like do what you need to do because those are the I mean really important moments. And work is important, but so I'm. I'm you, you touch on all these like really good feeling like words. Uh, <laughs> I'm a mama bear, yeah, yes. <laughs> yeah, and um, in just looking at uh, your website, you know, the, the values of your of Bloom Bright, mm -hmm. um, uh, can you speak to a, a couple of those uh, mm -hmm. values and, and why they're on the website? So three of them are in the title of this talk. Um, the other two, flexibility for us is huge. I think for any startup, uh, that's important for us, especially in consulting, uh, it's very important. And then with we have- a family. And with a family <laughs> and- <laughs> Yeah, um, so flexibility is huge and transformation. So I think for us, like wanting to always be better and wanting to, um, yeah, transform your skill set and, uh, you know, we want to be the best, uh, but we don't want to compete with each other to be the best. We want to, you know, just keep pushing ourselves to do better work and to develop more as a team and to support each other. And uh, I think that might be the most fun about doing a startup is that you get to choose your own team, right? I mean, it's kind of a dream. So, uh, any uh, any advice and maybe an anecdote or two of uh, choosing your own team and. I should be really good at that because I'm a recruiter, but um, it turns out it's really hard. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, I think, <laughs> I know, whatever, whatever, yeah, it, it can be difficult. I mean, I think that one thing to really, I think, really think about is there are different stages to start up. So, like, it's pretty common to start something with friends, right, or with people that you've worked with before. and. Um, you know, it's common, I think, to to start with people that you can afford, like 
contractor. They had a contractor in India and he was amazing, um, but required a lot of my time to manage him. Um, and we did some great work together. Um, but I think just knowing that there's different phases of a startup and different people that fit them potentially well, depending on where you're going. Um, personally, I don't know if I would do very well at like GE. If you put, I don't, I don't follow rules very well either. So uh, <laughs> my husband and I always joke that if I worked for the government, I would be fired in less than a week. And he's probably right. So. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Not for any ethical reasons, very likely. Probably just for speaking. <laughs> and that's what I right, because uh, I think uh, what's really important uh, in, in startup culture is candor. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think uh, that's, uh, that's kind of interesting. So uh, when we talk about um, things that you, you, you want for your, your employees, people that work with you, uh, them to be able to bring their authentic selves to work. Mm -hmm. I, I thought it was really cool when you said that. Mm -hmm. um, is that uh, is that one hundred percent of themselves, or is it like ninety five percent, or is you, like to, to, to your point about you know working for the government GE, right? Candor. Right? I think that's an interesting question, kind of a debatable one. Um, I think it's really bringing, you know maybe not all like the problems of the day too, and then spending two hours of your coworkers times talking about that, but like bringing who you are and what you want to do with your life. And for us, um, LinkedIn does this with their transformation. We've leveraged the transformation piece. And so they, when you go to LinkedIn, they'll say, uh, we expect you to go work somewhere else. So what do you want to learn while you're here? And let's make sure you do those things. And so, we want everyone to stay with us forever, but realistically, um, <clears throat> consulting is very challenging. It's very intense. Um, sometimes our people will fall in love with a client and they'll want to join a client or they'll just want to go in house or whatever they do. And so I really want to know, you know, what people love doing and what they're best at and really trying to be strengths based um, so that they you know, can do that. And yeah, I mean, we all go through hard times because we're human. Mm -hmm. And so really being able to support people who, you know, love what they're doing and care about what they're doing, but aren't going to, you know, be 100% all the time. So. Um, cool. I, I'm interested in talking about a couple um, hot buttons for startups in particular. Mm -hmm. um, it is every startup's dream to exit huge, right? I have like have 1,000, 10,000 times like returns, um, or be acquired and just be comfortable, and then start your next thing. Um, <clears throat> in our conversations, you've shared with me that you had the opportunity to uh, to exit, be bought out, be acquired twice. Yeah. twice. yeah. What's it like to say no? <laughs> um, risky and exciting to say no. Um, I mean, for us, I think it's a little different because we don't have a product. Uh, we're a, basically a service, right? So we're a consulting company. And we have two clients who wanted to buy us out. And for me, it really became about the opportunity cost of the business. Um, not like necessarily what it was worth at that moment, but like what could it be worth uh, a year from then or um, you know, several years from then because you'd have to pick up and start over from scratch. And I think maybe this goes to being the entrepreneur at heart, but I um, was actually a lawyer, uh, one of the lawyers I was talking to, who said, it's kind of like moving into your parents' basement after you've been out. And that was pretty much all I needed to know. We put in a high offer, they said no, and then that next year we exceeded. Um, yeah, because we done, so we don't like print any of the stuff necessarily, but we did like <laughs> 400,000 our first full year. And then we think we targeted 1.2 million and we did 1.6. And then we had another offer where I basically said, it's gonna be expensive. And we decided not to do it. So we just built a team and helped them for almost a couple years. And then, yeah, we'll probably do almost 3 million this year. So pretty awesome. Yeah, congratulations. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>
Yeah, so we do a lot of remote work because our team is all over the place. And um, we are very avid users of uh, the G Suite, uh, Google Hangouts, and Zoom, and Slack. Um, so I don't know if, if those of you are using Slack. They were also a client and a huge fan of Slack. I literally don't know how I would work without it, including because um, we work with our clients too. So then we'll have emails of our clients. So I have, I have literally like six emails right now and six different Slack's account, Slack accounts for all of our different clients. And sometimes now that we've gotten a little bit bigger, I won't end up on Slack because I need to get background checked and like the whole thing. And sometimes I'll just push it to the person who's managing the project. And I won't know how to communicate with people that I don't have a Slack with. I'll just sit there and be like, do, I don't know, do I text? <laughs> Like email and I'll literally sit there and be like slack to someone can you slack them for me like I don't I don't know how to how to do this so yeah um, we I mean being a startup we do a lot of stuff with G Suite and then I'm trying to think what else we have a lot of recruiting tools that we use that help us like LinkedIn recruiter and um, some, how about CRM we so we have applicant tracking systems in recruiting. Okay. Um, so we have one of those. We're using Copper right now to sort of track business development. Um, but we actually don't do a lot of business development. So it's more like capturing people we've talked to as opposed to a lot of our businesses. That's something we didn't talk, talk about is uh, referral based, um, which I think really goes to like your individual brand and character uh, as people wanting to seek you out to work with you. Well, I had the benefit of a reputation um, going into this. So I worked for another company for about eight years in total. Um, and then I built out a recruiting for recruiters company or like division for them basically. So in hindsight, knowing all the recruiters who are basically the ones who are going to say, we need help, come help us, was smart. Um, so I think it started with uh, my personal brand differentiating the company, which is just somebody who actually cared um, based on my interactions with like just being genuine and wanting what was best for people, even if that included saying like, maybe this isn't the role for you. Um, maybe you should go talk to this person. And from there, I think intentionally making it that way. So we actually, I think are one of the most expensive um, options, more so than some of the bigger firms because we are boutique and we turn away a lot of clients because we're small. Um, which I think actually makes people like us more because then it feels exclusive. <laughs> um, so I think there's a lot of like just different ways and it's being intentional about, um, you know, for us, it's quality and integrity. We want to be the best. And then we also like integrity is just huge. So if we want our clients to feel valued and to feel like we care and we do charge a lot, uh, but we will back that up, you know, it, eat into, I think we even did one project almost near a loss towards the end because we were trying, just trying to write the ship that wasn't going well. So I would say values. Yeah, you know, I think there's different options. In that particular case, um, I was the new recruiter and my boss knew a recruiter at Microsoft and they had a search no one wanted to work on. It was a C++ Mac engineer, uh, which don't really, wasn't really a thing that people did at the same time. Uh, so they put me on it, thinking that was really funny. Um, and then I filled that role and then went through all these HR hoops to like build that. And, um, you know, I think there's a lot of different ways. I mean, that was one, like a product of my boss's network and I think it's learning to network too and um, find the people that are the decision makers and then, yeah, finding a connection to them or, um, yeah, figuring out what the opportunity is worth to continue pursuing. So I came back to Grand Rapids from Los Angeles from tech recruiting and I started a legal recruiting firm and learned some hard lessons. Um, I think the biggest one was 
like looking at um, making sure that now I always try to, even if I'm emotionally charged about something, <laughs> like offended, upset, or feeling dismissed or something like that, I um, would try to step back and then be objective, which I think is important for a CEO, you know, founder of business, especially if you have, you know, values that are important. And so at the time, you know, I was in my twenties and I was a little bit hot about it and ended up not wanting to negotiate things. Um, and that ended up in a huge lose lose. And I guess I just thought, um, uh, that I didn't think that would happen. Um, so I think, you know, learning how to figure out the win-win and doing that anyway, even if it means kind of swallowing your pride or getting over something that's difficult.